ladies and gentlemen boys and girls dear students uh, on the behalf of media dialogue group mass communication management department of superior university i welcome you all at uh, this lecture com presentation uh, you can say on the park us relations we will start the proceeding with the recitation of holy quran but before proceeding to further uh, let me tell you that, that this is a made made an event of uh, media dialogue group of mass communication department and we will love to continue in such activities in future and the basic objective of this group is just to bring all of you to a platform where you can raise question and learn to raise questions so today's proceeding i will elaborate further but first we will invite uh, our student for the recitation of holy quran اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا استعينوا بالصبر والصلاه ان الله مع الصابرين ولا تقولوا لمن يقتل في سبيل الله امبات بل احياء ولكن لا تشعرون ولا نبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الاموال والانفس والثمرات وبشر الصابرين الذين اذا اصابتهم مصيبه قالوا انا لله وانا اليه راجعون صدق الله العظيم thank you sir uh before proceeding further let me introduce today's guest speaker mr tristram perry mr perry is currently serving as information officer and spokes person of un's consulate general in lahore and uh, before resuming this uh, assignment he has served as us embassy in jakarta as public diplomacy officer of broadcast media and and diplomat post in azerbaijan turkmenistan and washington dc mr perry has won the De department wide public policy achievement award for his work during uh, hillary clinton's visit first international trip and built state of the art departments uh, state of the art largest portal of public diplomacy He has also received five commendations during his service as a U.S. diplomat, including three meritorious honor award, a Franklin Award, and a Superior Honor Award. Before joining the U.S. Department, he has served for seven years as Boston Conservatory, winning a Blinger Award in 1999. He has got his education from Oxford. Ladies and gentlemen, before inviting our honorable guest today i will request you to please switch off your mobiles so we can listen to him his speech will be followed by the questions answer session mr perry i will request all the people to stay to your seats because their movement is disturbing the flow of lecture thank you very much Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And before I begin rem my remarks, I just wanted to ask if there are any reporters in the room. Anyone here from the media covering this event? Okay, great. This is off the record, and I think we'll have a much more frank and open discussion if it's me, Tristram, talking, as opposed to me, Tristram, the spokesman of the U.S. consulate. So let me just 
say that I see a lot of enthusiasm here, and I'm sure you guys are brimming with questions. Every time I go to a university, everybody wants to ask me questions. Some of them I've heard before. Some of them will be new. Uh, yesterday, I had the pleasure of speaking at LUMS to a group of students who were departing to go study in the United States. Anyone here interested in studying in the United States? Okay, great. Um, I want to just make a plug for usefp.org, the United States uh, Pakistan Educational Foundation. There is free counseling for any student who wants to go study in the U.S. that we provide via our consulate. Uh, there's a program available for you. There are possibly, depending on your academic interests and ability, scholarships to go study in the United States. We want to encourage people to go and study there. It's uh, the number one destination for Pakistani students who are studying overseas. Anyone tell me how many students they think are studying in, the Amer in America from Pakistan? Wild guess. How many? I think uh, more than 50%. Uh, well, no, I, I, just like a number. I mean, how many, how many people from Pakistan I'm looking for? How many do you think study in the, in the United States at the higher education level? Not many. How many? Two, four, six, how many? Four thousand, very close. Five thousand. Five thousand people study from Pakistan every year in the United States. We'd like to increase that number. So I encourage you to, if you have this interest, please go to our website or just search for counseling and we're happy to provide it. Okay. So I'm here to talk about U.S.-Pakistan relations, which are great right now, aren't they? Are they? Uh, you know, I've lived in Pakistan now almost a year, and it's been a tumultuous year. There's been a lot of events that have happened at the Eagle level. But, you know, yesterday when I was talking to these students going to study at the United States, I was really struck by how much they'd worked to get to this point to go have an education in the United States. And you look at the media, and you see that there's this a lot of negative information every day. I mean, I read, the, I read all the papers every day, and there's a lot, you know, I watch, uh, I read the transcripts from the television. There's a lot of negative material out there. There's a lot of things, and, and it, it is not profitable to produce good news. You'll find this. You're all students of journalism. No one ever, no editor is ever going to say to you, hey, go find me a happy story so we can put it on the front page. It's not what happens. Uh, I've worked with media for about the last 17 years. It was a very kind introduction. Uh, I, I was seven years in public relations and marketing. Now I do uh, basically public relations for the government of the United States. And so I work very closely with the media. But I've never found that they're interested in positive, upbeat, feel-good stories. You're not really going to find that on the front pages. That's not going to lead. That's not going to sell or get ratings. So by the nature of news, it tends to be negative. Now in the United States, our media is just as guilty. You, I was spoke, speaking, I speak to my mother on a regular basis. She's worried about me. I'm here in Pakistan. Uh, and I, it's reassuring to talk to her every three or four days. And, and she's up to speed. She knows everything that happens. The day that, I've got to call her every time something happens. So, you know, the day that Tassir, Governor Tassir was assassinated, I had to call her. Minister Bhatti had to call her. I mean, I keep calling her, and she, and she knows, she knows. And I said, Mom, you've never been so interested in my career. She says, oh, no, I'm not interested in your career, but it's on the front page of the New York Times every day, so I can't, you know, I'm worried. I'm very, very worried. But I think that's, that's the same. You know, the, the media in the United States is just as guilty as the media here in Pakistan. The stories reported about the two countries are negative. Now, does that mean that nothing good is happening between Pakistan and the United States? No, that is not the case. Sometimes what you read in the newspaper, shockingly, does not present an entire picture of one country. And just like I tell my friends and relatives and former colleagues that Pakistan is not a monolith. Pakistan is not what you're seeing in the newspapers. I got to tell you, what you're seeing in the newspapers is not my America. It's not the people I know. It's not my friends, my family. This is not my America. And so I find it very interesting that at the, what I call the eagle level, there's this negative perception, but on a person-to-person -person level, I was talking to 50 students yesterday who were psyched to go to America, and they wanted to know all about American culture and, and what it was going to be like on campus, and how would they get health care, and where would they find Pakistani food to eat, and stuff like that. And it was, so, so I think that on the working level, on the day-to-day on the -day 
person-to-person -person interaction, Americans and Pakistanis have a lot in common, and, and, and that we're more similar than different. But this is not an exciting headline, so this will not get reported in the media. Uh, I've lived all around the world, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Turkey, uh, Indonesia. I speak Russian, German, Indonesian, uh, some Azerbaijani. Anyone here is from any of those? No, they're all Pakistani here. Okay. Um, one thing that I've always noticed, when you, when you travel overseas, has anyone here, ever, anyone here traveled overseas before? Okay, a couple of places. Where, where have you been, sir? Uh, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia? Yeah, uh, Dubai. Dubai, okay. All right. For a long period of time, or uh, for a short period, sir. So, Jeddah. Jeddah. How long were you there? Eighteen years. Eighteen years. Okay. Is it different here? Uh, yeah. But you're 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 born in Pakistan. Yes. Okay. So and then you were there for eighteen years. Yes. And now I'm coming back from space, my space. Okay. Because uh, some issues I got in space uh, in my Pakistan schools. Did you have some culture shock? Yes. Did you have some culture shock? Was it hard to adjust? Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is. And, and I think when you travel overseas and when you get to know a foreign culture, you really learn more about yourself and you learn more about your own country initially than the foreign country you're in. Because you're always, that's, your, that's your standard for comparison. You're always looking back, oh, wow, how do we do it? Uh, this is different. And look, every culture, all culture is, is a prison. You know, you're kind of stuck in your cultural reactions, the things that your parents teach you and your religion and, and your friends, family, and schooling, you're there. So, so you have a certain reaction to another culture because you don't really understand it. And so you have to contextualize it on the basis of your own personal experience. And so having lived overseas in eight or nine different countries, I, I really tend to learn a bit more about who I am and, and my own culture. And, and one thing I find very refreshing here in Pakistan is I find there's more similarities than differences when it comes to the people and character of Pakistan. And I've thought about this a great deal. And I come up with a couple of different reasons. We have shared origins. We are both products of British colonialism who both struggled long and hard to break free from it. America just happened to do it a little sooner than you guys did, but we were fighting the same thing. But more importantly, the United States and Pakistan are rare. Most countries, are countries because they happen to be a certain ethnicity who had power. Uh, George Bernard Shaw said it best when he said, a nation is a dialect with an army. The US and Pakistan were not that. We were an ideal. We were a concept before we were countries. Both countries were founded on a certain set of principles and strove towards those in terms of get getting their independence. I mean, why are the Belgians the Belgians? because they're Belgian. That's, you know, that's, that's kind of why a lot of the countries that exist, exist. They weren't a concept that people struggled for and agitated for. The United States and Pakistan have that very, very unique thing in common. Not a lot of countries out there that have that. So shared history, shared conception. We've been allies for a long time. I know that this is, you know, everyone characterizes this as a rough patch, but when you go through it, I, every, is anybody here on Facebook? People here on Facebook? Okay, great. I want you to join the U.S. Consulate Facebook page, all right? We're giving away a video iPod. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of fun competitions. You know, I, I struggle with Islamabad. They want Facebook to look like the second website. They want to put press releases up. And I say, that's, nobody wants to read a p press release on Facebook. You know, we have 25,000 fans in Lahore. Um, and we've been doing this thing called Old is Gold. We did this competition last month, Old is Gold, where we showed great moments in U.S.-Pakistan history. Jacqueline Kennedy, JFK's wife, making a speech at Shalimar Gardens. Richard Nixon, touring in an open car all through the streets of Lahore. You know, uh, Ali Khan getting a ticker tape parade in New York with people with Urdu banners saying, yay, Pakistan. I mean, since the, uh, the, the very beginning, the U.S. has been a really, really strong ally of Pakistan. Have there been ups and downs? Of course. But I think if you add it up, if you add it up, there's been more friendship than enmity. There's been more cooperation than disagreement over time. And I think that's the, how, how the case is going to be. I mean, I think that if you look at your close friendships, you have falling outs, you have disagreements, and part of it is the level of intensity that, I mean, your acquaintances you tend to get along with all the time, right? Because you don't really see them that much, because there's not really that much interaction. But the people you're closest to, family, friends that are really close, that's when you tend to have your, your biggest disagreements. And I think that's, again, emblematic of the history of U.S.-Pakistan relations. I have a videotape in my possession that I got from the Nixon Library of Nixon's visit to Pakistan. 
And he explains the problems between the two countries, and they're the same as they were. Might, they might have done the voiceover three weeks ago. It's the same. Uh, and, and I think this is going to characterize our relations. I, I think that the, you know, we have some common goals, we have some shared goals, but really it's shared values. I find that Pakistanis and, the United, and Americans love freedom of expression, love freedom of the media. And although our development is, is, is different, it's also similar. It, we got our independence 235 years ago. And man, did we have problems. We were corrupt. We were very economically unequal. We were a weak state surrounded by enemies. We had the, you know, the French to the, to the west of us, the British to the north, and the, and the Spanish to the south. And none of them were happy that we had this weird people governing themselves. What is that? You have to have a king. You know? How can they possibly have people governing themselves? So we had a similar genesis. Uh, but again, it took a lot of time. It took, I mean, people think that we arrived fully formed as we are right now, as this democracy that has rights and privileges and safety and security. Well, no, we didn't. You know, we had a really difficult time going through. I mean, take a look at the 1800s and the corruption scandals in the United States government. And, you know, when America became free and independent, 4% of the population could vote. 96% did not have the vote. We had slavery. Women couldn't have the vote. I mean, all kinds of problems. And we developed over time as society developed worldwide. So, I mean, our trajectory towards democracy was like that. And Pakistan starts, what? You know, we had a 170-year head start on you guys. So, so I mean, there's, it's similar development, but at a much faster rate of growth. I mean, you have one of the freest medias in the world. You know, there are problems. There are problems. You know, don't get me wrong. But... I love the fact that Pakistanis feel that they can express. We drove through a protest on the way here. You know, would that have happened 20 years ago?